Hello, and welcome to Faculty in Focus. I'm Daniel Cantor, Associate Professor of Acting and Directing in the Department of Theater and Drama here at the School of Music, Theater, and Dance. And I am here with Associate Professor of Playwriting and Head of the Playwriting Minor, Jose Casas. Welcome, Jose. We're here to talk about Jose's work. Jose is a playwright, a scholar, um, and he has a varied artistry, writing uh, plays for adults and theater for young audiences, documentary theater, and has a whole uh, set of scholarship as well. So welcome, Jose. How are you doing today? Thank you. I appreciate being here. Good. Well, I have some notes because um, my synapses are decaying these days, so I need to refer to them to remember my questions. So I'm interested in uh, the, the Jose Casas origin story. Like, how did you come to become interested in theater and playwriting? What was the genesis of that? Um, I like the way you posed with the origin stories, because I'm doing a lot of projects that deal with superheroes and origin stories. Oh. I feel we could apply that to our own lives. Um, I grew up wanting to be the first Chicano governor of California. I wanted to be a lawyer and a politician. Um, if you had told me my first day of college that I would uh, graduate with a degree in drama, I would have laughed in your face. I had never really seen theater at all. Um, and as I went through college, I was actually getting a little disillusioned uh, because it was very white, very rich, the, the program I was at. We were two hours away from L.A. at the beach, and everyone wanted to be a corporate lawyer, entertainment lawyer. I'm like, what about justice and, 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 and all those kind of things? And I was lost for a while and then started taking English classes for my electives that I had to take or my requirements, and people noticed my writing, and they're like, you should pursue it. I'm like, I don't care, eh, whatever. Um, but little by little, I started writing more, and then, amazingly enough, I did a play, even though I'd never even seen a play, in my class, Age and Immunology, and this was 1989, so, I mean, these are the times where AIDS really was a death sentence. HIV was a death sentence. I saw, I was there when one of my friends saw his first lesion, you know, wow. so it was deep. And so I wrote, I wrote this one person story about this guy who had one year left to live, and so as I was turning in my final, my teacher loses it and starts to bawl. She told me she had made a copy for all her daughters and every uh, faculty member in the biology department. And she'd ask me, remind me what your major is, and I'm like, pre-law. And so she said, if you've learned anything in my classes, you're in the wrong major. <laughs> and so two days later, I did this funny little ceremony with my roommates and put English and drama into a hat. And I'm like, whichever one I pick out, I'm going to change. So I picked out drama. Like I said, never even seen a play, switch majors. And uh, for the longest time, I was like, what did I do? And so with every year of not making money, of sleeping on couches here and there, I almost decided to go back to law school. But eventually I realized that the reason why I was doing theater was the exact same reasons I wanted to do law. Mm. It just came out on stage. And so when I made that, like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, and then the rest is history. Wow. Yeah. So there were no, there was nothing in your family of like um, other people who did it or artists or writers? No. And in my community, the arts is a queer. That's, we don't talk about that. Right. It's no, that's, you go to the movies, you watch TV, but it's actually, you know, and when I told my dad, I had just gotten into law school. Oh, wow. And so that was painful. And, uh, and, and he, he struggled with it, not because he thought what I was doing was wrong. It's like I came here, you know, you know, did the coyotes into this country from Mexico stuff. I didn't want you guys to suffer. It was not what I was doing, but I didn't want you to suffer because of the career. And he was right, 20 years pretty much was just, yeah, but. Uh, How does he feel now about it? Uh, he feels now that I have a, a job with insurance, he's happy about that. <laughs> and so, you know, um, but yeah, no, I mean, he's always been happy with what I did. It's just, he just worries that, you know, making a living off of it. Yeah. And so even with my students, every student I get, I'm like, this is a very subjective field, and I know plenty of people with no talent making millions, and I know people so much more talented than me who have quit or are struggling. So if you're going to go into this, you, you, know, you, you, you have to go in 100%. So, yeah. Right. There are definitely like vicissitudes, and there's not always poetic justice. You know what I mean? Sometimes there's poetic justice, yeah. but not always. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm impressed by the, kind of the, the versatility of your career writing different kinds of plays, uh, plays oriented for adult audiences, plays oriented for young audiences with a wide range of young audiences, um, documentary theater. You now have some scholarship as well. Is there a kind of a common thread in all that work? What's the common thread that links your, your different pursuits? Uh, for me, it's political activism, social activism, um, whether it's scholarship or my plays, whether it's adult or for young audiences. Is um, I don't want to write 
something or engage in any project that doesn't have uh, this idea of, of making the world a better place and, and getting, you know, education or getting knowledge out into the world. I mean, I get it when people say, I just want to escape, mm. you know, and I just finished doing a play I co-wrote, a theater for the very young called Mariposa Butterfly. And it's about two neighbors fighting over a butterfly for little kids. But even then I sneak in, you know, some value kind of things like, you know, well, what's different about these two? Why are they? Because one's Latino, one's American on the, on the Texas border. That's where they live. And for kids, they're not going to see it. But for adults, I kind of like to put in even a little bit of uh, political kind of right. questioning. But what might the kids perceive in that? I think uh, for the kids, it's, it's, I think eventually for them, it's, it's that you can't control nature because of the butterfly. Um, but, um, but more just like, you know, we all have the ability to get along with each other, even if we're different. Mm. And I think a lot of the stuff, the social activism is trying to, you know, you know, just like Rodney King said, can't we all just get along and, and using that social activism, hopefully as a way to build bridges as well. Right. That's really, that's fascinating. And, um, to what extent do you want to be provoking adult audiences? Like, that's a, that's a gentle lesson for kids. Like, if you're orienting plays for adults, do you want to be um, sort of poking the bees nest? Oh, yeah, 100%. I, that's kind of, like, uh, my thing is, if you come out of one of my, especially adult plays, if you come out, like, pissed at me, like, oh, you this jerk, I'm like, oh, that's fine. <laughs> if you come out, I'm like, yeah, he's saying, you know, something, that's cool. If they come out saying I wasted $50 and two hours of my life, that's where... It gets me, and so I don't mind provoking, especially with my adult stuff. I probably am provoking with almost all of my adult stuff because I want these stories that aren't being told, stories that are affecting our communities to get out there because, like I said, it's, it's there, you know, my play 14 about immigration, that's almost 20 years ago, and the thing that, that kills me is that it's more relevant now than it was when I wrote it, mm. and that wasn't the intention. Right. You know, and it's just as bad. And so how do we use art as a way to really kind of reflect on what's happening in the world? So um, and I don't want even use the word provoke, piss off. Yeah. OK. You know, it's and and because my theater, the theater that I grew up with was Teatro Campesino in Luis Valdez, which was political agit theater. They would go into the field where the day laborer and perform there. Wow. So it was always about, you know, let's use our art to make this a better world for our communities and 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 just the style as well because you know uh, Valdez discovered theater through Bertolt Brecht yeah so without Bertolt Brecht there's no Luis Valdez if there's no Luis Valdez there's no me and so I take that as the foundation not only of me as a writer but as a person and it reflects my my favorite quote which is um, I'd rather die on my feet than live on my knees so I'm not someone who's quiet and uh right. So I'm going to voice my opinion because we only got one life, so you might as well use your voice. I hear you. And to what extent then do you feel like a play, a, a, a social justice oriented play or a political activist oriented play, that how much does it need to be sort of offering answers? And oh. how much does it need to be simply asking questions? I think it's asking questions. I don't think we are in a place to give those answers because I don't even know those answers. Um, but it's definitely uh, spaces to to begin dialogue for people to like to see theater and, and stories that they might not have understood. And I, you know, talking to you a lot and being your friend and colleague, I know that like representation in the art form is really important to you too. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, that you feel that Latinx voices are underrepresented in the field at present. I think all voices of color are underrepresented. Period. You know, and I even see now that, you know, one of the terms coming out is people of the of the a majority in terms of instead of BIPOC. And how I see how people get nervous when they say that or when people hear that, like, what? We're the majority. If you pick up all the people of color, we're the majority. So, yeah. And so that's a new trend in terms of identifying. I, 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 under, I understand the, the importance of representation in theater. You know, if you live in a society and, and your experience isn't reflected in the stories that the society is projecting out, that has a massive oh, yeah. sort of psychological impact. So I understand wanting to see stories that reflect on your own experience um, being amplified. At the same time, I have a philosophical question about to what extent do plays, do stories, do movies need to be a mirror? And to what extent do they need to be a doorway into somebody else's experience? That's a good question. I think, you know, one of the things, um, and I'll use uh, our, and, and we should probably have this talk anyway, um, with our students of color 
and how there's a schism between there's a there's a yeah um you know and we saw with somebody's children a lot with some of the emails i got from performing students of color and where you know uh there's this thing is like well it's the black play or the asian play i know i'm going to be cast right and it's like i just want to be an actor and i just want to act i'm like yeah for all the white plays and not that there's anything wrong with wanting to do shakespeare and all them but this systematic oppression has got it to the point where a lot of students they start to self-loathe and self-hate themselves and and we see it here in Michigan, and that's we need to do something about it. Whereas the other half of these these kids of color, our performers, want to see their their communities and their culture. So how do you navigate that that discussion? I'm actually like I said, um, I'm gonna write a play about it because it just hit me so much. I'm like, oh, there's a play there, you know. But it really, it's 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 that I, I don't know if I have a good answer for that. It's just you know, it's it's I think you have to do it case by case. Um, but yeah, it you know how do you distinguish and 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 how do you teach kids about their art and looking at the art that, with this way when they're still struggling with just self identifying? I think you know there are all kinds of stories, right? There are stories that are from a particular cultural perspective, yeah. and I think those are important to yeah. tell and and to produce. There are polycultural stories, stories oh, yeah. that are about many t- types of people together, like Water by the Spoonful or, or Junk, right, which we recently did. I think with that kind of range of choices and to try to be having your foot in all of those Oh, yeah, you have to. And- I mean, we have to still do Shakespeare. We have to do Brecht. We have to do all those as well. It's, it's, it's about, because historically, it's just been about the white male European writers. Right. So we have to be able to change that so they're all there. But also, too, it's also how does that reflect our students? We need more students of color to be able to do those. Because, like I said, when, when I hear a student of color, it's like, well, I could audition. I don't know what's the point. I'm going to get cast. Yeah, and, and, you know, in one of my plays, one of the students said, hey, Jose, you know, it's cool, but I knew I was going to get cast in your play. And my response was like, yeah, so what? What do you mean, so what? Well, I knew I was going to get cast. That doesn't mean you're going to be good. <laughs> you, you, I, I was like, yo, this is my play, and if you mess it up, I am going to tell you. You know, but just because you're Latino doesn't mean you're a good actor. <laughs> you know, instead of like, and this is educational theater, we have to make compromises. If this is a professional theater, I'm like, no, that's a different story, but... You know, you have to take that mindset of making it the best character you can and to be that positive character instead of saying, oh, I just got cast. Uh, here's a question for you. And I'm, I grapple with this because we're in a very precarious moment in America. Um, I mean, we had literally a white supremacist, an a, a overtly white supremacist president who attempted to end democracy. It's yeah. a precarious moment. And yet, as... It, as a institute of higher learning, there should be some space for different points of view, Definitely. different political positions. So what, what space is there for political difference in the classroom? And then the subsequent question that I've had to start to ask myself, which usually I'm a defender of political difference in the classroom, but today I'm like, well, but no Nazis. Like Nazis not allowed, you know? Like what? How do you not put your? Yeah, like what, what space do we have to make for political difference in the classroom? And what is off the table as part of the? To, you know, I, I think it depends on what you are and what you teach. Um, as a playwriting uh, professor, I don't censor. Um, and I tell students, you know I'm liberal, that's fine, but that doesn't matter as a teacher. Um, if you want to write a pro-Trump play, do I really want to see it? No, but that's not, my, uh, that's not what my job is. My job is to help you write the best play you can be, and if it's about Trump, then it's about Trump. I, I, that's not my business, you know? Um, I think it's about, like any kind of theater, um, trying to create a space that is inviting and saying, hey, every story is valid, um, regardless of what it is. Um, and like I said, I do not censor. If I censor, then I wouldn't teach. Right. Or if I was asked to censor, I would not teach. And, um, you know, because I think, you know, not all of our students are going to go and be Broadway stars. And so whether they go on to be playwrights or not, I don't care one bit. I just want them to be successful and critical thinkers. And so um, creating, I think we have to create those inviting. Um, and, but also acknowledge that by inviting all these stories, some of the conversations are going to get messy, maybe even heated, and that we have to find mechanisms for when it does get, okay, let's, let's take a time out. Yeah, I mean, that's, I'm hearing you talk about it. I'm really sort of admiring your perspective, and I think that you can do that well, which is a balance of, listen, I have my point of view. I'm going to assert my point of view. But here as the sort of, you know, um, moderator of this space, 
I'm going to allow for discussion and dialogue and differing points of view. I think it's really important today. Yeah, you have to. I don't think there's any because I even think that students whose whose sort of politics I agree with sometimes they want uniformity of opinion in the space. Oh, yeah. And and that's sort of a, a phenomenon right now. Yes. And, and to have them come around to understanding, they have to. To, to reconcile themselves to living in a space where there are diff different points of view. Yeah, and that's, that's a huge issue right now. And it's, you know, because we were there. We were like, you know, we protested and stuff. And it's just, you know, it's about them being so emotional and, 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 and sometimes even being confused about what they're fighting about. Right. You know, and, and, and so it's all right. It's just like, hey, it's cool. Just like the first draft, you write with your heart. The rest of the draft, you write with your heart and your brain. I get it. Let's talk about why. Um, because they're so emotional, they're so young, and they're still trying to figure out the world. I had one student, African American, and he and he goes into my office, and and like, yeah, this Jose and stuff, and then he's like, but you don't understand what we're going through. I kicked him out of my office. Come back, and we'll have this discussion. Well, well you and I have discussed before the, the sort of um, the current generation having some resistance to the work of Anna Devere Smith, who oh, is a pioneering yeah. documentary theater artist. And you know, um, um, you know, she will do subject interviews um, around an issue or, or um, an incident, like the riots in Crown Heights in um, in the '80s, and then will depict every person. And she talks about working outside of her gender and race as an effort to disrupt racist and sexist paradigms. Um, that is her orientation and effort. Now, someone might disagree with the outcome. But no one can disagree with her intention. That's what she's trying to do. Uh, and some students now find her work to be um, unacceptable. Oh, one of my, my colleagues, uh, the students basically took it over in Los Angeles. And the first play was Twilight in Los Angeles. It's the theater. Yep. And they basically were able to get it kicked off of the season. And one of their uh, assertions was like, we do not want to do the work of a racist playwright. In a million years, I never thought anyone we had the, the gall to call Anna DeVere Smith racist. And it's really them not taking the time to really see what her intent is. And, you know, and, and like even with this whole thing about trauma, you know, with Ruined, which is a beautiful play, it's a hard play. It's a beautiful play as well. And I'm like, do you think this award-winning playwright is, is thinking to herself, I want to cause trauma to my community right. when they write this play? No, this playwright is, is, re, is writing plays reflecting what she sees in the world, how she's reacting to the world. So before you go and say it's, it's, it's trauma on our bodies, really get to know first what that playwright's intentions are. I mean, story, many stories, all stories, let's say just across history and culture, stories talk about trials and tribulations and pain and grief and, and challenges. And it's part of what storytelling is about to find a way to process yeah. the things that are hard about being alive. Um, and so one thing I say to my students is that a depiction of things that are troubling, it, you're not, it's not the thing itself. It's an artful expression of grief. And we sing the song in order to feel better, right? We sing the song in order to feel better. It's like a good cry or whatever. It's an organized way to express ourselves. And without expression, actually, we're worse off psychologically. Is that, is that a insensitive thing to say? No, I think, you know, there's, it's that, you know, you don't want to get into the whole martyr thing, but it's just, I, it's, I think... And I can only, you know, um, in terms of like my experience as other artists I know of color, it's just, you just get tired. Mm -hmm. You just get tired when you've seen it's done so badly that even when it's done right, you're like, no, I don't want to. But as I tell students, you kind of need conflict in a play. That's you the whole do. thing. You need conflict. And like I said, it, it is really about just reassessing how it is and, and telling students, you know, you know, also, you know, if you want to be an artist, you also have to consider this too. That's true, and and yeah. I can't pass any judgment on a particular artist saying I don't want to participate in this kind of story for yeah. whatever reason. I mean, for for whatever reason, if this triggers my own deep yeah. trauma and I can't go there, I understand that. Um, but everything we're saying is reminding me of of an Oscar Eustace quote, and I've written it down. What, can I read it to you? Sure. And you can reflect on it. Um, theater is the essential art form of democracy. Theater can only emerge in the conflict of different points of view. Truth is not in the possession of one person. I agree. Yeah. You know, and when you take a look at this country, we're the only technically advanced country that doesn't have a department as part of the government devoted to the arts. The NEA mm -hmm. is just some money that politicians divide. And if you look at our politicians, you know, like I said, you know, I tell our students, do you know who Holly Hunter is? Like, who's she? 
I'm like, do you know what she did for artists? She was one of those artists, the NEA4, that challenged the, the concept of who gets to decide what art is. And those four people, their art isn't my taste. It isn't. Right. You know, at all. But what they did is allowed for me to write the kind of art I want and for you to. But even then, they don't know that history. And it's literally here at their, in their institution, in their department. And so it really is, like I said, how do we educate them? So I think, that, I think these students need to know the history. And they don't know enough of the history to appreciate and inform their arguments about the future. Oh, you know? that's, that's great. And, um, you know, uh, the, you're reminding me of something that I just, there was an article in the New York Times, I think last week, about arts organizations, theater organizations specifically, trying to pay a living wage. Yeah. Like even mid-tier theaters, um, paying not great. Like someone's in the costume department, they've been there for 20 years, and they, make, they can barely make enough to, to pay their bills. Finland, 2% of their federal budget is for the arts. 2%. So, and this would address many issues, even issues of representation. Oh, okay. If we had more money in the arts, we'd have more theaters, we'd have more arts organizations everywhere, and we'd have more arts in school. Yeah, you know, and, and studies have concluded time after time again, the link to, to kids um, being associated with the arts resulting in better, with them better academically. Right. That's been proven, and yet we're still farther and farther away and like I said I and I don't know what it is now I remember at one point when Schwarzenegger was the governor of California and they said the per capita spending per every person in California the arts was like 15 cents 17 cents yeah yeah <laughs> so how do you get kids into a theater program in college when that's how much they're they're yeah exactly you know they're spending on on, on kids to learn theater you know it's horrible uh here's a question for you uh, a sort of like personality question who are some of your like early influences or or mentors or maybe not even someone you knew like who Im impacted you? Influences? Um, Luis Valdez, definitely Teatro Campesino. Um, my mentor, who Jose Cruz Gonzalez, who's one of the most published playwrights in TYA, but now adult theater, he's out there and just his mentorship is just he's the reason I'm still here. It, no one, he him. Um, Brett Brecht, I love Brecht, um, and it's funny when people ask me who my favorite playwright is they're expecting this militant like writer of color like it's arthur miller <laughs> i have willie loman tattooed on my calf <laughs> um and it's amazing that i'm teaching playwright i was able to create a playwriting minor at the the college of my favorite playwright august wilson definitely i'm actually getting a tattoo that he uh, of a quote he wrote to me when i saw him speak and it was the funniest thing because uh i was applying for the stanford phd when I was applying for the, um, the MFA at playwriting at uh, ASU. And so um, my tour guide's like, oh, we're going to stop your interview today. We'll finish it, but there's a guest this afternoon, and you're, you're free to, to talk to him or go see it. I'm like, who is it? August Wilson. I'm like, what? Really? You need to ask if I want to see August Wilson. So I ran to the bookstore, two trains running, uh, the only script, and I went. And then um, this was an experience, man, and, and this is kind of like the problem right here. Uh, he's very like no colorblind casting, very, right. we still need, you know, uh, ethnically supported theaters and all this. And a PhD student rose his hand and said, I don't know why you people are complaining. That's the first thing he said. So I could already see the steam coming out of August Wilson's mouth or ears. And he's like, you guys are making great strides. Just look at the Lion King. Oh, Everyone rose their hand. I wrote like, oh, I don't care if I'm a guest. It was volatile. But this is someone who's going to be a leader in a theater department who just said this. And so I remember going up, and I was getting my autograph, and I was like a little junior high girl, all like, Mr. Wilson, you know. And, um, and he starts signing my play, and he's just looking at me. And he's like, son, you're a playwright, aren't you? I'm like, yeah, man, how'd you know? Because like, you got one big-ass mouth, dude. Oh, my God. <laughs> But that's all right, because I got a big-ass mouth, too, so keep fighting for that justice uh, and stuff. So Wilson, um, uh, Paula Vogel, uh, Paula Vogel, um, Tony Kushner, and like I said, Angels in America is one of my favorite plays, and I'm going to say this for the record. I've seen it now like six times. The best production of, of, of Angels in America directed by this man, by far. It was such a wonderful, just beautiful experience, so... You, oh, you. And, and so, yeah, those are the, the main ones that, if you ask me immediately, are the ones that come out to See, me. That, that list, that really sort of diverse range of playwrights and perspectives is so awesome because I think what it speaks to is what may be the, the main purpose of theater, which is to invoke empathy. Yeah. 
and that you can invoke empathy across culture, across time, right? What speaks to you? And things can speak to you from many different angles, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, it's just about seeing stories that resonate. And like I said, when I changed majors, like three weeks later, I'm like, oh my God, we're starting the new quarter. I'm a drama major, what the hell did I do? I was gonna go back and rechange my major. And I remember the class, it was uh, Theater 60. Uh, and um, we had to watch that of a salesman uh, with uh, Dustin Hoffman. And it was a big class, so we had over four different nights we could go and see it. And I went the first night, I went the second night, I went to every <laughs> night. And I remember thinking, I was blown away and thinking, you know, my dad came here undocumented four times before he finally made it and the shit he had to go through. And, 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 but my dad is really low and he might not be some Jewish salesman in the forties and Yonkers or wherever. My dad, you know, did any job he could, you know, picking the, in the fields, whatever. But Willie Loman is my dad. And that's what theater is about. I don't write just for my community. And I, I'm very strong about because the people who, from my community who see my plays are like, yeah, man, that's who we are. But I also want other people to see who we are in a real way. And I tell my students, like, one of my play, favorite plays is, um, that's not done enough is August Wilson's uh, Radio Golf, his last play before he died. And there's one, my favorite part is when um, uh, they're talking about, you know, uh, the woman's talking about, I knew I was going to marry this man. It was when he was changing the tire on the car in the rain. I was holding the umbrella up. I knew. I'm like, see, that's, that's theater, you know? And, and stories can be specific, but they're also universal. So if I, you know, if I see this cute girl, I'm like, yo, girl, can I have your numbers? And she says, no. Does it really matter that I'm a straight Latino man? No. Or... Because a gay person or a disabled person who has the same question, they're still going to feel like shit just like me. <laughs> it all sucks. The universality of rejection. Yeah, um, man. But, but it's so true. Like the paradox of universality is that it's only found through the specific. I through agree. Through particular. Right. And that, that's the paradox. That if you tell a story from a specific perspective, it both represents yeah. where it's coming from, but it also will communicate to people who don't have the yeah. identical experience, but they can understand it sort of metaphorically. And it's, it's a struggle, dude, because me and a friend in L.A. were having this... Uh, argue, not argument, we were having a discussion in, in L.A. It seems like all the L.A. playwrights were united. Like, yo, why don't they do our plays in L.A.? Mm -hmm. They seem to do it everywhere. And for me, most of my plays have not done, been done by Latino-run theaters. Mm -hmm. So I even struggle with that. Like, yo, what the hell? Mm -hmm. You know, everyone else is doing my plays, but you should be doing my plays. So even then, you see these, these dichotomies. Right. Um, but yeah, no, like I said, I, I, you know, like I said, I want everyone to see my plays. I want everyone to, to feel that empathy. And, and because like I said, I think in the end, we're all more similar than we are different, but history has taught us differently. And, right. and especially when they're learned behaviors, I think for theater, part of it is how do we help unlearn those behaviors? Cause I'll bring up 14 again. Um, we had a woman, when they did at a community college, she wrote to the board, she actually wrote to the governor in Arizona, how dare you spend my money on this? Mm. It's, it's my tuition, our state, and on this liberal propaganda BS. Mm. Fast forward seven years, and she's a board member of that theater. So anything is possible. I know I've heard people say, theater cannot change, and that's their opinion. I, I, it changed me. Yeah. So I believe in it. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah, you know, empathy is the opposite of bigotry, in yeah. essence. And empathy, to me, is almost synonymous with imagination, yeah. right? Oh, yeah, so if you can be cultivating your imagination, you're going to have the capacity for empathy. And when you yeah. have the capacity for empathy, you have the capacity to see somebody else's humanity. Exactly. And, you know, and, but sometimes, too, you can't, you can't be kumbaya about it, either. That's sometimes true. Sometimes you have to yell. That's and, true. You know, it's... Uh, like I said, a lot of the work right now is me yelling and yelling and yelling and, and being mad. And, and uh, like I said, you know, all the books I'm working on are all about the lack of diversity in the field, every single one of them, and, and introducing and giving access to different scholars and, and artists of color. Um, a huge project I'm doing is a superhero project, and I'm really proud of myself because I've managed to get 19 playwrights a commission development and production of their jobs all around BIPOC superheroes. So, and we have 23 theaters across the country, including the Kennedy Center and Honolulu and Seattle. Um, and I shouldn't be doing it because I don't know where I'm going to get the time, but it's just like, no. You know, and someone asked me, like, how were you able to get 23 theaters across the country to pay this money and incorporate these plays into their future seasons? And the, the answer is simple. I'm like, I asked. <laughs> I love that. I asked.
This is the other thing about Jose that you may not know. He is a, he is a pop culture maven. <laughs> Superheroes, lunch boxes with 70s TV series, Everything. Star Wars, yeah. right? <laughs> Everything. And um, what's the best musical ever? I want to say Rent, but Hamilton's coming in a really close second. Okay, we saw Hamilton together. Yes, it was and, my uh, second time. But yeah, Rent probably is just okay. because Rent was the f when I saw it for the first time, and I've always thought musicals were all right, but Rent was the musical was the way that had me change my mind about how to view musicals, and I'm actually beginning one with the composer in Austin. But Rent was literally that was the I learned to really change my mind about musicals because of Rent. So that's why. I'll say that's number one. So among other things, Jose Casas is a rent head. Yes. Um, Jose, thank you so much for no, participating. It's all good. It's all good. Thank you for joining us for Faculty in Focus.